Greetings. This is Lex Berman. I'm speaking to you from Arlington, Massachusetts in November 2020. I want to first uh, thank Rafael LaGuardia for inviting me to speak and to Peter Bull for referring me to your program. I also want to send a hearty Greetings to all of my friends and colleagues in Brazil and all the students of the various disciplines who might be interested in historical GIS. You might be studying history, you might be studying poetry or anthropology or philosophy, and I encourage you to use whatever kind of tools that might help you in your research. At the same time, I would like to warn you not to get lost in the tools themselves or building the tools rather than doing your research. And historical GIS, and specifically the China historical GIS, are enterprises, they're projects that require a lot of, a lot of research, a lot of digitization, a lot of input, and a lot of quality control, and a whole lot of problems could be encountered along the way. So in today's talk, I'm going to break it down into a few sections. Uh, first, I'll talk about the background, the origins of this particular project, the China Historical GIS, called CHGIS. And then I'll talk about how do you come up with a project like this? You have to formulate questions that the project should answer for you. So it's too easy to get you know, just have a general idea, say, yeah, we'll build this historical database, and then the scope of the project creeps all over the place, and you can never quite get control of it again. So we'll talk a little bit after the background and formulating the questions about a historical GIS to the methodology of showing how places change over time. There hasn't really been a definitive answer about how to do that. However, there is a very definitive book about all the different kinds of methodologies and approaches of historical GIS, and it's written by Ian Gregory and Paul L. And I think that uh, for the overview, you can check that book out. And I will just stick to just specifically the kinds of questions and methodologies that we had for the China Historical GIS. After we talk about methodology, then a little bit about, like, what is it good for? What, why would you build a historical GIS? You know, what would you use it for? Some of those things might be gazetteers or search engines for historical places or geocoding your information to those historical places. And, of course, representing historical places on maps, which is probably one of the key motivations for creating a historical GIS. But also spatial analysis and thinking about change over time, as well as linked data, because more and more projects are able to share information through programmable interfaces. And that is one of the future directions that is very promising for historical GIS. Finally, in the closing remarks, I want to talk about how CHGIS caused me to rethink basic notions of historical geography, in particular, whether or not boundaries are the best way to define historical geographies or networks of interconnected nodes, interconnected places, and the kinds of flows or relationships or journeys or uh, political events that happened that connected those places, it's, not, it's still not clear to me that historical GIS has to be about establishing boundaries around political or social or religious spheres of influence. And that has traditionally been one of the approaches in historical GIS. I think it all boils down to the data. What kind of data do you have and what kind of questions do you want to answer with the data? So that's the introduction, and uh, now I will divide the talk into these sections and uh, see if we can cover them all in a short period of time.
Now, the origin of the China Historical GIS dates specifically back to Robert Hardwell. He was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and he had created his own historical GIS. And this was after he retired, he started a private company, and he had actually digitized uh, a number of the major dynasties and polities for historical periods like the Tang, Song, Yuan, Ming. And this was basically covering a large span of time from, say, the 9th century to the 17th century. He did this by starting from a modern GIS data set. And that data set was actually provided to him by Larry Chrisman from Griffith University in Australia. So he used these modern boundaries, which were down to the county level for the year 1990, and uh, he reconstructed them. For example, if there was a traditional prefecture in, say, the Ming Dynasty that he thought was best represented by adding two or three modern counties together, he would merge those counties together and say this was the historical prefecture area. And he would provide a note saying how he had developed that particular area, that particular polygon in GIS, by combining those original 1990 counties. However, in some cases, they just didn't fit. So he began a large you know, scale process of dividing them where he felt they weren't quite right or adding other pieces that he thought were needed in order to represent what he felt was the historical uh, evidence. However, the result of this was that it was a kind of a heuristic tool that he was interested in connecting to other data, in particular biographical data of Song period. So that was his main focus, the Song dynasty period. He had these large indexes of biographies. He wanted to be able to show relationships or concentrations like where the people had passed the civil exams or where they were born or whether or not there were networks of uh, aristocrats or scholars or nobles. And he wanted to be able to depict them in space and show them on a map. And that was his original purpose. So that goes to the questions of why are you building a historical GIS in the first place? So that is really the, the key thing to, when you're going to start off a project is to figure out you know, what it is you want to show. Now, uh, Hartwell passed away, and his data was bequested to Harvard University. And at Harvard, uh, there's a professor, Peter Bull, who took this project up, and he really wanted to try to do something with the legacy of the, the geographic database and the biographical database that Hartwell had left to Harvard. Now, he started uh, asking around about this, and it turned out to be two very different specializations. So the project was split into two halves. There was the geographic research side and the biographical research side. And uh, my job uh, was the, originally, was to help write the grants and to uh, organize the meetings in which the major parties would come together to discuss the project. And then later on, I worked as a project manager for China Historical GIS. So in the earliest meetings, Professor Bull was gathering together some of the major researchers in this field, and he wanted their advice, like, how do we proceed? Because they had the Hartwell database to start with, and they wanted to move forward. So they got the major center, the key research center in China for historical geography, which is at Fudan University. And at that time, the director was Ge Jianxiong. And Professor Ge, I must say, in my opinion, was a progressive person in terms of his point of view of what could be done with historical GIS. Uh, most of his colleagues were very text-based, only interested in writing narratives about historical places. And of course, they compiled many, many, many tables of information in their research, but they weren't interested in compiling a database of all of the historical Chinese units. They're really like interested in specific topics, specific cases, and specific periods. And Ge saw the opportunity and, and the uh, possibilities of what would happen if we could create this large database of all the information and how research could be conducted with it. So it was with his support and the leadership of the team at Fudan that was picking up 
from the actual work that was put into the first major historical atlas of China in eight volumes. And that was edited by Tan Qixiang, who was the earlier director before Ge of the same center in Fudan University. So essentially, that's how it started. We had Ge Jianxiang involved, and we had Peter Bull, and we also had G.W. Skinner. And some of you may have heard of Skinner. He was a professor at Stanford and then later at UC Davis. And he is quite an original thinker in applying the concepts of central place theory to historical geographies of China and agrarian, the conversion of agrarian systems to modern marketing systems. And he conceived of this hierarchical regional space or regional systems analysis that I can discuss a little bit later on, but essentially he was a key figure in understanding the problems of historical geogra geographical research in China and collecting the data sources because he had edited a huge number of bibliographic resource volumes for China and Japan. So with these people involved, um, we were able to get major support funding from the Henry Luce Foundation and then later from the National Endowment for Humanities. So that brings us to the next question of how are you going to do this? How are you going to compile all of this data? So essentially we sat down and had to formulate the questions of what the project was going to accomplish. So in that case, we, we sat down and, and the major uh, editors and contributors decided that they wanted to have a database that you could look up a place name and you could find out when that place name existed in the historical context. What dynasty was it in? When was it called that? And what jurisdiction was it in? We also wanted to know where it was located. We wanted it to be able to appear on a map. So in a way, that, very, that limited us right away because the only things that we could put in to the database had to have a name and they had to have a location that we could find on a map. And there are many other cases in historical GIS where you don't really know the name of a place even though you know where it is. Or you know the name of something but you don't have evidence to know where it is. But we decided to put it in the database. We had to know where it was, at least as a point on a map and its name. And we additionally wanted to know what kind of administrative unit type was it. In other words, going back in time in history, what are the units that we're looking at? We're looking at, you know, administrative units essentially here. We're not looking at any kind of thing that existed in time, like a holy site, a church, a settlement, a mine, a, a, a river dam. We're not putting every single possible feature into this. It was essentially a administrative geography of change. Now, why? Well, one of the major reasons why is because that's how the data was organized. The original Chinese sources come from something called historical gazetteers. But the word gazetteer in the Chinese context is really a compendium of information, and they're organized typically around places. Therefore, a compendium of a particular county would exist, and those would get compiled into compendiums of the provinces that contained those counties and then they would eventually be compiled into national level gazetteers. So we have these major works that had been compiled over hundreds of years in China, and those became known as dynastic geographies, the geographies of administrative change. So we had those, and we thought, well, let's start off with a proof of concept. So after you have the questions formulated about what it is you want to achieve with your GIS, then you have to figure out, well, how can we compile from the sources we have some kind of data model that will answer those questions? You have to also figure out the data types, uh, raster, vector, raster being like a checkerboard in which each square has a value, vector being points, lines, and polygons. And for our purposes, we basically found that the data is organized about places in terms in two parallel factors. On the one hand, a place is identified by its administrative seat. In other words, 
where is the administrative office located, basically the capital of that administrative geographic unit. So a county always had a capital office somewhere, and a prefecture always had a capital office somewhere, and a province always had a capital office somewhere, and there was a hierarchy. So counties were parts of prefectures. Sometimes they were directly parts of provinces, and prefectures were parts of provinces, and so on. So uh, building up from the source data that we had and all these compilations that had been done over time, we thought we would do a proof of concept and we would say, look, we'll focus on one part of China right around Shanghai, the Songjiang district. And we would focus on that area and see how much time and resources it took to compile these historical changes and to know every time a seat got created in a particular place, what year it was created, and then when it changed into something else, a new record for that place. And so in doing this, this is how we came up with the data model for CHGIS. It's certainly not the ideal way to do it, but in our case, when we had to create new records and introduce them into the database without disrupting the whole data model, we found that this simple model of saying this place existed at this time according to this evidence and it was part of this other place and it had a date associated with when it was established and then we just said it remained until it was abolished or changed to a different place, a different name, or had a different status. It was promoted to some higher status as a prefecture capital, for example. And so this is how we developed the data model. Now, Compiling it is its own problem. I'm not going to go into too much of that here. But essentially, um, compiling it was to take all of the existing tables and enter them into the database and make sure they had geographic points or polygons associated with them. By the way, the second part of the tracking of change over time was to try to define polygons. So in the proof of concept, we said, well, we'll try to show every county boundary change. And as it turned out, that to be proved to be incredibly time consuming and difficult because the evidence of where the county boundaries were going back in time was almost non-existent before a certain period. So we could do 100 years, 200 years, but if you went any further back than that, it gets really difficult to keep compiling it backwards in time. So our data model ended up focusing on points. Now. What about points? Well, for one thing, we wanted to take the best available county data we had, which was a 1911 survey, the very end of the Qing Dynasty period, the end of our data coverage period, and we maximized the number of points that we could find on a modern map. In other words, on the historical map from 1911, we had all the towns listed there and showing relatively where they were, not to scale, not perfect, but relatively. And then we started mapping them to a contemporary base map in GIS. So then we had an accurate location as far as we could tell for that historical place. And then we knew that because they were appearing on a particular county map, that they were part of that county. And that helped us define the, the full extent, the shape, and the area of each county for 1911. So even though that project to create that base map for 1911 was not really the change over time that we were trying to achieve with CHGIS. It's still an extremely useful database all by itself and a great artifact that you can download and use. Now, once we had a base map for 1911, then we started mapping out province by province depending on how the materials were organized, and you could see the versions of CHGIS as they were published over the years. And each version would add, like, extend the geographic scope and eventually go in depth through the changes in time. Some places had better coverage than others. Some places had more accurate information about those changes in time. And that was the nature of the data that we knew we could never accomplish a complete definitive database of all 3,000 years of Chinese history. But we knew also that we had a lot of data that we could get in there. Like, was it going to be 50%? Was it going to be 60% of all the known counties and higher level units? We weren't sure, but we knew we had a lot of them. 
And that was our goal, and that was what we tried to achieve in uh, in the whole project. Now, let's not go too much into the time spans and the, the relationships between the places that that we modeled in CHGIS. Let's talk a little bit about what do you do with GIS? I mean, once you've built it, well, what do you do? You you can do geocoding. You can do analysis. You can do you can build gazetteers and search engines. Um, you can link the data back and forth to other types of geographic information, and um, you can create published products, published databases, and um, you can have feature type ontologies that were associated with your data. And so there's a lot of information that gets generated by one of these projects that can be useful for your research. It just depends what you're trying to do. But I'll give you an example. So when I first was building this project, I was noting that the core, so-called core 18 provinces of China don't really include what was previously known as the border regions of Tibet, Xinjiang, Mongolia especially. Now, Tibet, of course, was a particular interest to me because at the time there was a lot of political oppression, basically, of the Tibetan people while we were doing this. And, uh, you know, frankly, it was something that a lot of scholars were concerned about trying to really study and understand the history of Tibet and not just the Tibetan Autonomous Region, which is a, a province level unit in China, but the greater Tibet, you know, the region, the identity where all the people lived, which is scattered around not only in many provinces in China, but also spilling over into other countries. And so I talked to Gene Smith, who had set up the Tibetan Buddhist Resource Center, and his data person, Fred Coulson, and we sat down and made a way for him to geocode the information that he was building into his database of all the monasteries. At the time, though, Gene was really keen on just preserving the information about the monks, their lineages, and their printed works, and their teachings, and this sort of thing, and he did not have the time to go and try to figure out where each of these locations were, which is very time-consuming, very time-consuming. So it was only later on when I finished my own project, which I'm going to describe now, that I was able to then move on and do some more about Tibet. So what did I do? Well, I took the National Gazetteer for 1820, and I took the section on temples and monasteries, and I geocoded them, because we had full layers for 1820, and we could see where all the county-level units were. So it was very easy to geocode these to the counties. The, the, the record would say, this temple is located, you know, 15 kilometers to the northwest of this county seat. So I could geocode it perfectly to the county seat, although I didn't know exactly where the temple was. And the amount of research time it would take to figure out that was not something I could do for the 2,400 entries and the amount of time I had, which was one semester. So I had a research assistant go in and just geocode them to the nearest county, and we got them all in. And I can show you this map now, which is a nice distribution map of all these Buddhist monasteries and sites that were recorded in the National Gazetteer of 1820. Now, I showed this to some people, and they're like, that's ridiculous. They said, it's laughable. There's nothing in Tibet and Qinghai, which are the main areas where Buddhists lived. And I thought, that's amazing. You know, do you have data about it? And Karl Ryavek had done a lot of research on eastern Qinghai, and we we looked at that, and then we, we compared what he had found in eastern Qinghai, which was 600 locations that were not even mentioned in the National Level Gazetteer. So what's going on there? Well, I thought, let's keep going, and, and I talked to David Germano, and I, I worked with uh, Jeff Wallman and Chris Tomlinson at the Tibetan Buddhist Resource Center later on, and eventually we did complete, we, we merged and completed a very large data set of Tibetan monasteries, historical monasteries. So this is basically all of them that were established that we could find that are known to us, and there's about 3,000 of them. Now here's the interesting thing. If you put them side by side, 
they are almost perfectly meshed, which says to me, and I mean, this is my opinion, others may disagree, but it says to me that the political and cultural and economic and religious centers of the Tibetan people, when you go and map them, have a, a defined area of influence where they existed over time that is just right on a border with the main Chinese area of influence and population. They share a border. They didn't really overlap much. There's an area of Sichuan that it ran right through Sichuan, which was originally how the province was divided. It was Xikang into two halves. The western half was the Tibetan half, and the eastern half was the Chinese half. So if you look at these maps, I think you can really you know, learn something by having input all this data. Now, there's all, all kinds of other things you could geocode. Uh, we geocoded garrisons in the Ming Dynasty. We also geocoded courier routes. So the courier routes are interesting because they're obviously like connections that represent the flow of commerce and uh, political power and so on. And so I think that you can learn a lot from these projects. We could also use points to connect data about historical economy. Uh, we do have a tax data set for the year 1077 of the Song Dynasty, and Peter Bull digitized the data and then geocoded the tax quotas for that year for his area of interest, which is where the data exists. It didn't exist for the whole country of China or the whole empire at that time, the Song Dynasty. But what's interesting about this data that Peter Bull was trying to show is if you look at the black figures, those are town tax quotas. And if you look at the yellow and red figures, those are the county and the prefectural tax quotas. The argument here is the towns, although they're not the official tax collecting sites of the administration, have begun to generate a rather large portion of the economy of this region. In other words, it's showing how the economic geography is changing faster than the administrative geography. Moving on, if you have polygon data and you have data that you can map to the polygon data, then you can do some interesting chloropleth maps. This is showing the numbers of people who pass a civil service exam in a particular decade in the early 13th century. And you can then see how certain areas were influential, and this can be done over time. The problem with these boundaries, as I mentioned before, is that you're not always able to define the boundaries. And what happens if you have a case where you have sort of larger unit boundaries, like prefecture boundaries, but your data is actually hooked to counties for which you only have points. In that case, you can use GIS methods, for example, Voronoi or Tizen polygon methods, where you can take a set of points that exist inside of a perimeter, in this case, county points inside of a prefecture perimeter, and you can auto-generate areas. And if you did this for each prefecture of, in this case, Shanxi province, then you could have a, a data set that you could attach your county level data to. So in this case, we had some population data normalized by area. You can then see there's certain concentration that sort of goes in a diagonal, and that can be compared to a different kind of tax figure based on grain production. And here's, this is what I wanted to point out about normalizing the data by area. If you looked at the raw figures of where the grain production tax was incurred, it looks like the northwest part of Shanxi is the most active area. However, that was a lightly populated area. There were some military encampments there. And if you normalize that by area, you would see a different picture indeed. You'd see something much more like the population. And that makes sense because if you compare it to the terrain, you can see that this major river valley, which was like the major mode of transportation, does track to both the population and the grain figures.
Now, if you think of the courier routes I showed before, it's interesting contextually if you just take sort of the historical background of where the courier routes were, and then you look at something else, like, for example, the high-speed railway network. Then you can see that the Qing Dynasty courier route stations shown in purple dots created a groundwork for the modern railway system, which stands to reason because those transportation routes would get built up over and over and, and developed over time. If you then look at it in the context of physiographic macroregions as defined by G.W. Skinner, um, you can sort of see how the regionalization and the connection between the major regions developed. What's interesting is if you start to look at uh, the kind of data I mentioned earlier where the civil service exams were held and passed. These are not where they were held. They were the number of people who passed the exams. Now these are cumulative for an entire dynasty. So in this case, this is the Northern Sung, and you can see really clear regionalizations. And for context, we've put them on top of the physiographic macro regions and the high-speed rails. So even though the high-speed rails is like completely idiosyncratic, but it's, it's just interesting as a backdrop for where the regionalizations occurred. So in the northern Song, you can see a concentration of forests along the east coast. If you look at the Ming dynasty, you can see that the Sichuan region became less important and the inner regions became more important, as well as a spreading out in the northern regions. In the Qing, you can just see a, sort of an increasing number of people entering and passing the exams, as well as a much stronger influence from the north around Beijing. Now, these are cumulative for the entire dynasty, so the, the exams were actually held once every three years. We could watch a video of one dynasty. We happen to have the Ming dynasty each three years subsequent, three years exams, we actually have the numbers for it. And then you can see that there is actually um, a spreading of the different exam takers throughout the whole empire. It wasn't always, of course, there's always a high concentration in the, in the east and the southeast. But as you can see over time, if you watch the animation, it will, it will vary over time. And that's, that's quite interesting, too, to see what historically is going on using your data. Also, um, when you digitize these projects, you realize that you begin to question some of the notions about what historical places are. So when you look at one of the traditional atlases of Chinese history, for example, the Hermann Atlas, and you see this gigantic, gigantic empire representing the Yuan Mongol Empire, then you see that it extends from Dalian, you know, all the way to Poland. And you begin to realize, well, wait, is that really how things were? And it reminds me of the recent election that we had in the United States only days ago. And if you see a map of majority vote for each county of the United States, spatially, you have an impression of this gigantic Republican area. And, you know, the coasts and certain other areas, Illinois, you know, a few inland states are blue, representing Democrats. But if you actually do a cartogram of population, as this animation shows, you can then get a better feel for the locality and the density of the people there. And I think that nodes and networks of connections between the nodes might be a better way to represent historical geographies than boundaries. In support of this, I would talk about a little bit about G.W. Skinner's central place analysis, which became known as regional systems analysis. Essentially, you have a way of looking at both the physical geography, which are physiographic macro regions, and those are based on where the mountains are and where the major river systems are and where their major transportation systems are and how economies form in these natural units, 
and they're not the same as administrative divisions, modern administrative divisions. There's some correlation there, but they're based on the physical geography of the place. And then there's what he calls the macro regions, the socioeconomic macro regions. And these are based on markets, on flows of money, on population, on access to goods and services. And it's also measured on an urban-rural continuum. So Skinner's theory and Skinner's methodology has the calculation of, of two, two axes, essentially. And one axis is the central place, the centrality of a place, which is there are certain places that are very high in the level of urban hierarchy. They're very central. They're the capitals where all the money is, where all the power is, and where all the goods and commerce flow from and to. And then there are the peripheries, which are very lower down on the economic spectrum. They have little economic activity. They may be highly rural, have low populations, and have difficult difficult transportation and, and uh, connections to other neighboring areas. So that's the urban-rural continuum. And then the centrality values are the level in the urban hierarchy. And when these are combined, you come up with a way of analyzing these nested economic spheres and creating regions out of them that are formed based on the data that you have about these economies and these cultures, and not so much on just the arbitrary borders that are drawn as political divisions. And so I really think that both of these cases, the case of looking at how we try to define historical places using points in order to draw polygons, and also the case of Skinner's analysis, looking at how centrality and how the physical landscape are big factors, and that the borders that we draw, the borders that were drawn in history, are notional. They're not rooted to the ground. Cities are rooted to the ground, settlements are rooted to the ground, and the relationships and transportation networks among those can be mapped. And I think maybe it would be better to focus on that than on just creating more boundaries, which are like projections of national identities that didn't exist, perhaps, at those remote periods of time. And we should refrain from imposing our modern views of national identity and nation states into the remote past because they didn't exist then. And that's basically a nutshell view of the China historical GIS and a little bit about the context that it was created in. And of course, I refer you once again to Ian Gregory and Paul L., who have a much broader overview in their book about how all the different historical GIS projects were developed and their methodologies. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that this has been a little bit useful to you, and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.